Good morning again, church. Terry's uh, gracious allowed me to preach the last Sunday of every month. Um, so if you were confused about why I was standing up here right now, that's why. Um, and uh, just as we prepare to go to, um, to the Word, let's pray uh, one more time. Gracious Lord, as we come uh, to your Word, uh, we just humbly pray and ask that uh, you would give me clarity and wisdom to say only what is true. Uh, Lord, may you be exalted through the preaching of your word uh, as a church. May we be responsive and humble and repentant to where your word confronts us. Lord, may we be driven to excel still more uh, in glorifying you and obeying all that you have said. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so... Um, what I've decided to do is that we will very slowly be working through the book of 1 Timothy, um, and then I'll just count on you to remember everything that I've said once a month um, as we, we work through this book over um, however long the Lord allows us to be in it. So um, the reason I, I chose 1 Timothy um, is, one, because this is going to be a, a wonderful book for my own soul to study, and, and you all get to be a, a part of that as I, I look to First Timothy to even receive instruction for myself as a, a pastor and a shepherd. Um, but also, I love the book of First Timothy um, because if you can see the title of the message, the book of First Timothy is, is a blueprint for a healthy church. Right? Paul wrote the book of First Timothy because he wanted the church to be a healthy and thriving church. And so he gave instruction on what the church should look like. And so uh, we're going to work through First Timothy, and we all get to be shepherded together as we seek to, um, as I said, excel still more as we look at what God has said about the church and what we are to be about and what we are to do. Uh, Paul tells us in Timothy how we should love one another, uh, what we should do together as a body, and, and what the church is to look like. And so we all get to work through that together and see uh, where the Lord is calling us to, to grow or, or repent or even be encouraged uh, in these things. And so I'm very excited um, to to work through this book together. Uh, just an uh, outline for this morning um, as we prepare to dive into the book. Um, we're going to do a brief overview of the book and just look at uh, what are some of the major themes and, and purposes and why Paul wrote this book in the first place. And then from there, um, we'll spend some time just looking at the, the opening uh, first two verses of First Timothy and Paul's introduction. So um, a, as we prepare to dive in, why is it important um, for us to spend time uh, looking at that themes and purposes and, and flow of a book before we just dive in. Um, it's important because the, the books of Scripture, um, they're not just uh, literature or nice stories. Right? The books of Scripture, in their very nature, they are propositional. Uh, they are telling us something that we need to know. Uh, this means that they're written for specific reasons with specific goals in mind. Uh, that means that everything that the author chooses to include in a book relates in some way to that overarching goal of what they're trying to communicate to us. And so knowing the overall purpose of a book is essential to knowing how all of the individual constituent parts fit together in that book. Uh, so knowing the purposes and the themes of a book, it helps us to read it correctly. It helps us to put everything in its proper context. Uh, keeping those things in mind while we work through a book, it protects us from parachuting into a passage uh, and isolating it from its larger God-given context and then walking away with the wrong interpretation. Uh, wrong interpretation. Uh, interpreting Scripture correctly it helps us to live our lives faithfully. Right? To a large extent, your faithfulness and obedience in the Christian life is dependent upon you rightly understanding, understanding and applying the Word of God to your life. Right? You can read the Bible, but if you read the Bible and walk away with the wrong conclusions, that's not going to equip you for faithfulness and obedience. Um, and so we spend time talking about what a book is about and understanding it correctly because it enables us to uh, read it as God intended. And so uh, with that in mind, we'll, we'll take a look here at 1 Timothy as a whole. Uh, Paul mostly, most likely wrote 1 Timothy uh, sometime after the events recorded in the book of Acts. Uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, you've probably referred, uh, heard them referred to as the pastoral epistles. Right? They're Paul's letters to his colleagues in ministry, um, instructing them, 
um, in how to faithfully lead within God's church. Uh, chronologically, Titus and 1 Timothy were written uh, probably very close together. Uh, we don't really know which one of those would have come first. Um, and then 2 Timothy would have been written at the very end um, of Paul's life. And although this book is written to Timothy, um, it was really written with the intention of the entire church being the audience. Right? And we're going to take a look at how we can um, say with confidence that that is, is true. Um, but that means that the intended audience was not just Timothy, and therefore it's not just written for pastors. It's not just written for those in ministry. It's written for all of us. Um, so this is a book that all of us as, as a church, uh, we get to learn from. Uh, that means no one gets to sit in their seat and check out because they think that this book is not for them or these sermons are not for them, right? This is for us as a church. So uh, if we look at Timothy, uh, we see that he had a uniquely close relationship with the Apostle Paul. All right, we can't say for sure, but it's possible that Paul met Timothy on his first missionary journey through the book of Acts. Um, uh, in, um, excuse me, in his first missionary journey through uh, Lystra. Uh, what is stated explicitly in Acts 16 is that in Paul's second missionary journey um, through Lystra, he encountered Timothy in the church there. Uh, it says that Timothy was well spoken of by the believers there, and so because of that, Paul conscripted him into service, and he accompanied Paul going forward. Uh, so Paul took Timothy under his wing and discipled him in the faith, uh, raised him up as a leader in the church, uh, so that he would be able to pass the baton on to him in ministry. Right? Paul, Paul did this. He took um, people like Titus, like Timothy, under his wing and discipled them to raise him up as pastors because Paul knew at the end of his life there needed to be another generation of pastors after him. And so that's what Timothy was. Timothy was someone that Paul was discipling with the intention of passing the baton to. Listen to how Paul refers to Timothy in different places throughout his letters. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 17, it says... That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Uh, Philippians 2, 20 through 22 says, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel, served with me in the gospel. And even uh, as we dive into 1 Timothy chapter 1 this morning, we'll see how Paul refers to him as his true child in the faith. Uh, so we can see this uh, unique and special place that Timothy occupies in Paul's heart. Um, it says a little bit further down in chapter 1 that as Paul was on his way to Macedonia, uh, he left Timothy in Ephesus so he could strengthen and pastor the church there, uh, specifically so he could put a stop to false teaching that was going on in the church. And so uh, now Timothy is there in Ephesus, uh, and Paul writes this letter to Timothy, both to encourage him and help him in his ministry, and to strengthen and build the church as a whole. Right? So if you're looking for an overarching purpose, uh, Paul writes this book uh, to strengthen and encourage Timothy in ministry, and to uh, strengthen and encourage the church as a whole. Um, as we survey the book, we can highlight a few overarching purposes that Paul has. Um, the first um, one of the major themes of the book is dealing with false teachers in the church. Uh, this is a, a huge part of 1 Timothy. We see that stated explicitly um, as the primary reason that Paul left Timothy in Ephesus, right? It was to deal with false teachers who were troubling the church. It's a major concern in the book, and it bookends the letter. Paul begins the letter with this subject, touches on again in chapter 4, and then returns to it again in chapter 6. So one of Paul's biggest concerns, one of the driving forces behind this letter, and was uh, dealing with false teaching that was creeping into the church. And you can see this is always one of Paul's greatest concerns uh, for churches everywhere, uh, the spiritual integrity and fidelity of the churches. Uh, we can see in the book of Galatians how Paul feels about false teachers, saying that if anyone teaches a gospel other than that which is true, they should be accursed. Right? If we are even an angel from heaven, we're to preach a gospel other than that which is true, let them be accursed. Right? Let them go to, to hell, literally. Right? Let them be apart from God. That, that is how Paul feels about false teaching. Um, we can see uh, later on in Galatians how Paul tells the story of even confronting Peter, right? one, one of the founding apostles of the church. When Peter was out of line, Paul confronted him to his face because of his poor conduct, was out of step with the truth. Uh, so Paul becomes aware 
of the situation in Ephesus and how the church was being troubled by false teaching, and he dispatches Timothy to deal with the problem. Um, we can't know for sure, but with the way that Paul describes the false teaching that was taking place, this even could have been coming from unqualified elders or leaders in the church um, that were opposing Timothy. And this would make sense uh, because of Paul's instructions to Timothy later on on what qualified leaders look like in the church and exhorting him not to let anyone look down on him because of his youth. Uh, but even if it wasn't coming from ungodly or unqualified leadership, this still represents a serious problem that needed to be dealt with for the purity and protection of the church. Okay, and um, as, we, as we think about this, as we see how much of a concern false teaching was from Paul, um, I think there's implications for us in that. Uh, I think we have to ask ourselves if we take false teaching, if we take things that aren't true as seriously as the Apostle Paul did. Uh, I, I think and I feel that we can be so nonchalant as Christians uh, about false teaching and about the danger of false teaching, about what we are exposing ourselves to. Uh, what, what blogs are you reading on the internet? Uh, what devotional books are you reading? And I know probably not a lot of people read blogs anymore, um, but a lot of people read devotional books. Friends, be careful what you pick up on that shelf. Just because it says devotional does not give them a license to write whatever they want. I don't care how it makes you feel. If it's not true, it's not from God. Right? We, we expose ourselves to so much danger. Uh, what sermons are you listening to? What are you putting into your ears? Uh, there's so many great resources for us today as Christians, but there's so many bad ones too. Uh, Paul talks about these false teachers devoting themselves to myths and genealogies which promote speculations instead of the stewardship that we have been given from God. And then later on, we see the consequences of this. Paul says that people have made a shipwreck of their faith. Right? That's the end result of flirting with false teaching. They make a shipwreck of their faith. Now, beloved, if you're not careful about what you put into your mind and your heart, you can shipwreck your faith. We need to take the purity of God's truth so seriously. Uh, the truth of God's word is a lifeline for you to stay on course in your spiritual life. Right? God's word proclaimed and understood is a lifeline, is the lifeline for your spiritual health and your walk with God. If you cut that off, if you look for that somewhere else, you will make a shipwreck of your faith. So Paul writes 1 Timothy to confront false teaching. Um, second, Paul wrote 1 Timothy to strengthen and instruct Timothy for ministry. Um, we see that Paul, Paul writes this letter um, not just exhorting Timothy to deal with the false teachers, but because Paul just wanted to encourage him and instruct him. Um, he knew that as a young pastor, Timothy needed instruction on how to faithfully lead the church in different ways. And he also knew that Timothy would need encouragement as he walked through pastoral ministry in the church. Uh, we can see a few examples of this instruction that Paul is giving Timothy. Uh, for example, in, uh, later on in chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, Paul charges Timothy to wage the good warfare and to hold the faith with a good conscience. Uh, chapters 3 through 5 are full of different uh, practical matters for the church um, and for church order that Paul instructs Timothy on. But uh, beyond general church order, um, and fighting against false teaching, uh, Paul also gives a specific goal to Timothy uh, that he is called to as a pastor, uh, which is raising up other faithful leaders in the church, just like Paul has done with Timothy. Uh, that's why Paul covers leadership qualifications in chapter 3. Right? He lays out what leaders in the church are to look like. Uh, Paul expands on that. Um, it's implied in 1 Timothy because of uh, giving the the qualifications of leaders, but if you jump to 2 Timothy, and you look at 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 2, Paul tells, uh, Paul tells Timothy to take what he has heard from Paul and entrust it to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Uh, so, in other words, one of the primary goals of pastoral ministry is not just being faithful as a pastor yourself, uh, 
but raising up other faithful pastors to lead with you and follow after you and to be sent out to pastor others. That's one of the things that Paul uh, commissions Timothy to do um, in the church. So um, for Timothy to do that, uh, this requires that uh, the men in the church would do certain things. And for us to do that, that requires the men in the church um, to do certain things. Um, Two, uh, excuse me, um, first, uh, this requires that men in the church are growing in maturity and genuinely seeking to be like Christ. Right? In order for pastors to raise up pastors in the church, it requires that the men of the church are growing in maturity and are genuinely seeking to be like Christ. If you read through the elder qualifications, aside from having the spiritual gift of teaching, the qualifications are all descriptions of godly character. Right? The, the descriptions of an elder, right? the qualifications of an elder, it's not a list of spiritual superpowers that nobody gets to have. It's a picture of a godly, mature man. Um, so those are not just things that leaders are called to. Those are things that all Christians are called to. Um, in particular, the men, is, they are those that God calls to spiritual leadership within the church. Um, and so we can see the implications of Paul's command to Timothy to raise up leaders in the church for all of us, that we would all be found faithful, that we would be a church of those that in our character would be qualified to be leaders. Uh, the second thing, okay, so the first thing that's required for pastors to be raised up in the church is qualified, godly, mature men who respond to the word of God. The second thing that's required for pastors to raise up more pastors in the church is that men need to be responsive to God's leading and drawing them to ministry. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 says that those who aspire to the office of overseer, overseer desire a noble task. It is a good thing to want to be a pastor. Right? That is a noble thing to aspire towards. Uh, to be clear, there are some men who pursue ministry who shouldn't or who aren't ready. Uh, however, there are others who are gifted and are growing in godliness and maturity, but they're still just sitting on the sidelines. Right? Men, God needs you. God grows his church through godly men becoming pastors. And we need to be faithful and responsive to God's leading in these things. Okay, so Paul writes 1 Timothy to combat false teaching. He writes 1 Timothy to encourage and instruct Timothy. Um, and then a third, he writes the book of 1 Timothy to instruct the church. So, as we said in the beginning, even though the letter is specifically addressed to Timothy, Paul had an expectation that this would have been read to the entire church. Um, this doesn't come through in the English, but if you look at the end of uh, 621, at the closing of the book, Paul says, grace be with you. And that you is a plural noun, um, you. I don't know what you guys say up here, down south where I'm from, we say y'all, right? This is, this is a plural you. This means that Paul is addressing the entire church. He had an expectation that the whole church was listening in, even as he directly addressed Timothy, this was not a private letter that Timothy kept in his desk, right? This was something that the entire church was an audience to. And so Paul clearly expected the church to hear the contents of the letter. So with that in mind, you can look at uh, chapter 3, 14 through 15, and Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So Paul explicitly states that one of the reasons he wrote the book was so that the church body would know how it ought to function. Uh, throughout 1 Timothy, Paul gives us a picture of a healthy church from the top down. Um, having healthy leaders all the way down to healthy individual members functioning together um, in the body. So uh, these are things that we should keep in mind as we work through 1 Timothy. Uh, ultimately, Paul wrote this book because he had a pastoral desire to see the church in Ephesus thriving 
as they lived out their Christian lives together. Right? That, that was Paul's overarching desire when he wrote this. He wanted to see a thriving and healthy church. And so as we work through this book together, that's my desire, is that God would allow us to be a thriving and healthy church as we're equipped from God's word. Uh, so as we come to the book, we come humbly uh, with a desire that God would use it to uh, cause us to grow in maturity, to grow closer in our walk with him and closer in our love for one another. So with all of that as the backdrop, um, let's turn our attention to, for the remainder of the morning to the words of Paul um, in the introduction to the letter. Right? So you can look at uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So uh, this follows the pattern of a typical greeting, which would include the recipient's name and um, some version of a greeting and a blessing and a prayer. Um, however, uh, this does not render the actual contents of that greeting superfluous or unnecessary, right? And this goes back to what we said in the beginning. When an author wrote scripture, every word was intentional and every word was superintended by the Holy Spirit. So even if this does follow a formula of a greeting, that does not mean that the words can just be skipped over. I think that Paul was very intentional about what he chose to say and include in his greeting to Timothy. So as we work through this, we see first Paul introduces himself and he includes his credentials as an apostle. All right, and this isn't just a polite greeting and it's not because he thought that Timothy forgot who he was. Right? I think he's very intentional in this because remember, a major theme of 1 Timothy is that Paul is confronting false teaching in the church. Uh, Paul's not just concerned with the theological misunderstandings and the false doctrines taking root in the believers, uh, his concern is deeper. He wanted to ensure that the false teachers themselves were not given a platform, platform or a voice within the church. Uh, he wanted to cut the false teaching off at its source. Uh, think, if you will, of how Paul begins his letter to the Galatians. Right? He gives a testimony of his whole uh, ministry, of his conversion, and how he came to be an apostle. Now, often the first thing that Paul's opponents would do would be to attack his credibility uh, or his testimony, uh, say that he wasn't really an apostle, that he didn't really speak from God. And so Paul was forced to defend his authority as an apostle, as an apostle and the credibility of his profession. So it doesn't tell us here um, that these false teachers in Ephesus were attacking Paul um, in this way. Uh, it's possible that they were and Paul knew about it. Um, or it could be that Paul is just heading it off at the pass because he knows that um, that, that could be something that's being said, right? That some might question his authority to tell them what he is in his book. So Paul is reminding them that he's an apostle from God. Um, he speaks with authority. Um, he reminds them by implication that what he is saying is what God is saying to them. Uh, so put another way, he reminds his leaders by what grounds he is able to write to them authoritatively. Uh, he not only reminds them of those grounds, but also reminds them by what grounds he is an apostle in the first place. Uh, he says he is an apostle by the command of God. This is similar to how he describes his ministry elsewhere in Scripture. Uh, in Galatians 1, Paul says of his apostleship, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. So Paul's ministry and his mission, it was not bestowed upon him by another man, uh, or by some group of men. Um, it was not even given to him because he asked for it. Uh, Paul says that he is an apostle by the command of God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul pronounces woe to himself if he were to not preach the gospel. And he grounds that sentiment in the fact that he does not preach of his own will and that he has been entrusted with a stewardship. So uh, that means Paul does not have an authority that is innate to him. He doesn't have authority because he was the most gifted or because he strategically climbed the ministerial ladder. His authority is a derived authority given to him by the one who has absolute authority. Right? That is Paul's authority as an apostle, a derived authority from the authority of God. So Paul writes what he does because he has been given a divine commission 
to strengthen and protect the integrity of the churches. So when Paul says that he's an apostle, uh, he isn't puffing out his chest or arrogantly trying to be superior to uh, get his way. Uh, This isn't Paul on an ego trip because he feels like he isn't getting the respect that he deserves. Uh, In fact, elsewhere in scripture, Paul says he has a right to make certain demands of the church as an apostle, but he chooses not to out of love because he doesn't want to put a stumbling block in front of them. Uh, Paul's not interested in how people think about him. Paul couldn't care less what people think about him. He cares what they think about God. He cares how they respond to God's word. And so when people attack his apostleship, he doesn't defend it out of some kind of insecure defensiveness. He defends it because he wants to see people repent and trust in God. So unlike the insecure manager at your work who goes on a power trip when they feel like their authority has been questioned, uh, Paul is like the father who sometimes has to go to that rebellious young child and remind them, hey, I'm your dad. Whether you like it or not, God put you under my authority. I don't know if any parents in this room have ever had to have that conversation. It's not because you like me, it's because God puts you under my authority, right? That's what Paul does often with the churches. You need to listen to me because God put me in authority over you. Uh, So from the outset, he's reminding Timothy and the church in Ephesus, by extension reminding us, that he has authority to exhort and command and correct us. And yes, we're in a church that preaches scripture. This is not something that is new to you. And yet, it is so possible to become nonchalant with scripture. It's so possible to forget what it actually means that it's authoritative. Right? This is a good reminder for all of us that when Scripture speaks, God speaks. What Scripture says, we must obey. These are not suggestions, friends. These are not just good ideas that will help us as a church. What Scripture says, we must obey. Paul was authoritative in his letter to Timothy. Paul wrote God's words, and so we must respond to it appropriately. So, Uh, In verse 1, Paul goes on to talk about the character of God and of Christ in the second half of that verse. But we're actually going to wait and come back to that later on. For now, jump ahead and look at verse 2. It says, To Timothy, my true child in the faith. So first Paul introduces himself and reminds reminds us of his authority as an apostle. Now he introduces us to Timothy. And we see in this expression his pastoral and even fatherly love that he has for Timothy. I I think there is one sense in which Paul is reminding the church in Ephesus of Timothy's close association with him as a way of supporting Timothy's pastoral position in the church. Uh, Paul just finished reminding his readers of his own credentials, and now he reminds them that Timothy is his appointed delegate to them. So Paul reminds them, I'm an apostle, I'm authoritative in the church, I have a commission from God, a divine commission. Timothy is my son. Timothy is my son in the faith. I sent him to you. You need to listen to him. Uh, Paul later tells Timothy not to let anyone look down on his youth, implying that there were some in the church who had trouble respecting or following Timothy. Uh, Beyond that, Paul goes on to tell Timothy that he needs to go toe-to-toe with those that are spreading false teaching in the church. So with all of those things in mind, Paul front loads the letter with a reminder that Timothy is an authority in the church, not just because he is a pastor, but also because Paul himself commissioned him and sent him there as an apostle. Um, But I think that Paul's endearing description of Timothy goes deeper than that. It's not just a pragmatic reminder of Timothy's authority in the church or his position. Paul loves Timothy, and he is seeking to encourage him with this affectionate description of his relationship with him. Uh, And so do he also sets an example of what pastoral love and care looks like. Uh, And while this would be especially true of a pastor's love towards those in his care, this is really what love should look like between any fellow believers in this type of discipling relationship. Uh, If you're younger, uh, maybe you've had someone spiritually pour into you for years. Um, They've helped you to grow as a believer, and you think of them as a spiritual parent. If you're older, maybe you can think of those that you yourself have poured into, uh, 
You've got to watch them grow and mature as a Christian because of how God is using you or used you in their life. And as you read this, you can relate to how Paul thinks about Timothy, that fatherly, endearing love that you got to watch use you, and through that, you develop such a closeness and affinity and love and affection for someone else in the faith. Or you think of that person where you say, I wouldn't be where I am today if they hadn't have loved me in the way that they did, if they hadn't poured themselves into me and helped me to know what Christ was like. And you think of them as a spiritual parent for the rest of your life. Uh, This love that Timothy had, that Paul and Timothy have, is not unique to them because of Paul's apostleship or because Timothy was his delegate. Uh, This is indicative of the bond that we share when we live our lives together as believers. Uh, My prayer that this is something that all of us can relate to. Uh, But perhaps you're sitting here and you can't relate to what Paul is describing. Uh, maybe there isn't anyone that you can think of where you would feel this type of affection towards them or, or they towards you. And friend, if that is the case, then perhaps you need to draw closer to the church and seek out relationships where others can pour into you and pour into them. I know some people have been burned by churches. I know not every church does this well. But friends, this is what church looks like. This is what we're commanded to do, to come and to love one another, to expand and be expended. And if you have no idea what this love feels like, then perhaps you have not experienced being close in a healthy church. And I exhort you and I encourage you, be part of the family of God. Function in the family of God. Allow others to see your life and to pour into you. Be willing to be expended and to pour yourself into others. Friends, if you are breathing and you know Christ, you should disciple other Christians. There is no tier that you have to reach before you're qualified to pour yourself out for the sake of the church and to pour yourself in the lives of other believers. This is status quo for believers in the church. I pray so much that this love that Paul describes here would be indicative of something that all of us experience at Fellowship Bible with one another. So, finally, uh, let's look at how Paul intentionally encourages Timothy in this greeting. So now look back at that first half of chapter 1 where Paul is talking about his divine calling as an apostle. Uh, Paul is very intentional in the beginning of this letter to remind Timothy of the character and the attributes of God. Notice he says, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Okay, so as we look, God our Savior. First, Paul reminds Timothy that God, the Father, is the originator of the plan of salvation. God sent his Son to save sinners. God is a loving Father and a saving God. And this is the pattern of God, this, excuse me, this pattern of God as our Savior is how he has chosen to interact with his fallen creation since mankind fell and needed a Savior in the garden. He promised in Genesis 3 that he would crush the serpent's head. He showed his merciful saving love when he called Abram and made him into Abraham He continued to show his saving love when he rescued his people from Egypt, when he mercifully did not cast them out in the wilderness but brought them into the promised land, when he brought them back again from Babylonian captivity, and then finally and most fully, he has shown his saving love by sending his own precious son to die in our place and purchase eternal salvation for us. God truly is a saving God. And now we continue, we see that Christ Jesus is described as our hope. Uh, Paul does not stop with just reminding Timothy that God is a saving God. He moves on to the second person of the Trinity and refers to him as our hope. And certainly he has the eternal hope that we have in Christ in view when he says that. Uh, But I think that is not all he's referring to. In Paul's love for Timothy, he wants to see Timothy 
strengthened and encouraged. And in the hard labor of ministry, he knows that Timothy will be tempted to hopelessness and discouragement and despair. And he reminds Timothy where he needs to find his encouragement and his strength and his energy and his hope in ministry. It is found in Christ. Uh, is not found, friends. Your hope in life is not found by pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's not found in just trying to have more self-discipline. Now, maybe you need to grow in self-discipline. I am not uh, disparaging self-discipline. But your self-discipline is not the foundation that your hope is built upon. Your hope is built upon Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of all your hope in your life. So ultimately, what is Paul doing here? He is reminding Timothy and he is reminding us by extension that our lives and our ministries and the health of our church is grounded in the character of God. It is not just those two attributes of God. He is reminding Timothy that his ministry and his life is grounded in who God is. That is the building place for everything else. As we look at just these two short verses, Paul mentions God the Father twice, he mentions Christ Jesus three times, and he highlights aspects of their character. Paul is infusing theology proper into just the introduction to his letter, because that is the place where it must start. If we have a wrong view of God, we can never be a healthy church. If we have a wrong view of God, we can never be healthy believers. This must always be the starting place, who God is, who Christ is, and who are we to him. God has saved us and Christ is our hope. If that is not the summary of our Christian life, everything else will be wrong. Nothing else matters. I don't care how well you can articulate other things. If you don't have a right view of God and of Christ and of yourself, everything else is wrong. So Paul is writing to Timothy and to the church in Ephesus because he wants them to be a healthy church and he starts by putting the focus on God and on his character. quote from one commentator says, what Paul seeks to impress on Timothy from the outset is not, however, about Paul, his style, his policies, or his custom. It is rather about God and even more prominently about Christ Jesus. Okay, and now if we look at the end of verse 2, look at the encouragement that Paul gives to Timothy at the end of verse 2. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So he prays for him to receive grace and mercy and peace from God. And we've already seen the love which Paul has for Timothy, but now Paul expresses that through his desire that Timothy would flourish personally in his pastoral ministry in Ephesus. So briefly, if we look at these three things that Paul wishes for Timothy to receive, grace, it means goodwill or favor. Theologically, the grace of God is his undeserved gift of love and salvation along with all the other manifold blessings that he bestows upon us. Mercy is God's compassion towards us, his loving kindness. This is the other side of the coin from God's grace. He gives us kindness and love that we don't deserve, but he also withholds the punishment that we do deserve. And finally, peace. Peace is something that everybody seeks after and few find. Uh, the world thinks of peace as simply tranquility and an absence of trouble. Uh, however, the biblical reality of true peace, as we know, goes far beyond that. Uh, when the Bible speaks of peace, it's often speaking not only of the experiential peace that we have by trusting God, uh, but ultimately it is pointing to the peace that we have been given by God through Christ. Uh, think of the words of Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, grace, mercy, and peace. Friends, what does that sound like to you? This is the gospel. There are many that would say that Paul's greeting here is just formulaic, just a benign way to begin a letter, and that because of that, the words don't mean much more than a polite greeting. Friends, I don't believe that for one second. 
Paul is being so intentional about how he opens this letter to his spiritual son in the faith and his co-laborer. Paul is reminding Timothy where he is to find his hope and his peace, how he is to be sustained in ministry. It starts by knowing and loving his Savior. And for all of us, this is what we strive for together as a church. Friends, let me plead with you. Don't ever get beyond the gospel. Don't ever get bored with the gospel. That's not just a temptation for you, that's a temptation for me. That we would think there's bigger and better things. That we would think that the gospel is just the starting point and then we graduate to something more profound. Friends, if you think there's something more profound than the gospel, you don't know the gospel. A glorious God who should have crushed us in our iniquity sent his own precious son to die for us so that he could redeem us and make us eternally part of his own family. What is more profound than that? If we get beyond that as a church, we're not going to be a church for very long. And so even in the beginning of Paul's letter to Timothy, he reminds Timothy what's really important that we know God, that we know who he is, and ultimately that we know and we treasure the gospel. We can never graduate from that. Being a healthy church, it starts, and I would say it starts and it ends with knowing our Savior, loving our Savior, and loving his gospel. If we do not start there, the rest of this letter doesn't matter. As a church, we must know and treasure Christ and daily live in light of what he has done for us in the gospel. That would drive everything that we do. Everything else is motivated by the fact that a loving God has poured out the riches of his grace on us. And as undeserving recipients, all that we want to do is please him. All that we want to do is everything that he commands us to with joy, not with grumbling, because he is worthy, is he not? Amen. All right, to that end, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we love you. We see what you have done for us in Christ, and we have no words. Lord, I, I pray, I, I beg that as a church, we would treasure the gospel that we would treasure the person of Christ. Forgive us, Lord, for being so idolatrous. Forgive us for being so easily distracted. Lord, may we, as a church, see Jesus and love Jesus and orient our entire lives around who he is and what he has done for us. Lord, to that end, we pray that you would be at work in our hearts. And in Christ's name, amen.